everyone, and welcome to this, to this new series of discussions between Yaron Brook and European intellectuals on various topics. So today is the first discussion, and the topic is capitalism versus Marxism. But it's not one of the usual discussions where your usual Marxist is someone who hates progress or doesn't like human beings, and they would rather have humans extinct in favor of polar bears. So we bring one of the best Marxists that we can that there are out there, someone who is in favor of progress and someone who is in favor of the vision of the Enlightenment. And we're going to see what the discussion brings up. So on the one side, we have Yaron Brook. So Yaron is the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, and also he's the host of the Yaron Brook show. He has written various books more relevant to this topic, The Free Market Revolution with Don Watkins and Equal is Unfair, again with Don Watkins. And on the other side, we have As Dr. Ashley Frawley. Ashley is a senior lecturer at Swansea University. University. She's a commentator. You can, you probably, you if you watch the newspaper review on Sky News, you have seen her. She's also been on BBC. And she has written a book called Semiotics of Happiness. And actually, this is a book that I think even objectivists will enjoy because it's a criticism of this idea that says money doesn't make you happy. So before we start, a big thank you, obviously, to the Ayn Rand Institute, which is uh, sanctioning morally, but also materially, these discussions. And of course, to the Ayn Rand Center UK for the initiative and for all the energy that Razi has put in it. So, uh, so let's begin. The frame of the discussion is which is the system which is beneficial for human flourishing and, pro and progress. Is it capitalism? Or if capitalism at one point was the system that brought this progress, is now capitalism an obstacle that stands in the way? And if yes, is there any other system? Is there any other way to organize the economy or to organize society that can bring better results? We start with Yaron. Thank Nikos. Thank you, Ozzy. Uh, thank you guys for organizing this. And thank you, Ashley, for being willing uh, to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, I think the first question we need to ask ourselves is what leads to progress? If we're taking as an assumption, we all agree that progress is good. And, you know, let's assume we agree that we're talking about the same thing when we talk about progress. Maybe we'll dig into that later. But let's assume that human well-being, standard of living, quality of life, life extents, uh, uh, you know, extent of life, health, all of these things that involve human well-being are something we value and something we want to see in the world in which we live. Then the question is, where does that come from? Because clearly forever, that wasn't the state of humanity. For hundreds of thousands of years, uh, life, extent, life, uh, life was short, Uh, life was brutish. Uh, life was brutal. Uh, it was not pleasant. It was not uh, materially successful or spiritually uh, successful, with a few exceptions here and there in particular cities and particular eras. But overall, income did not rise. Life extent. Uh, life. Uh, uh, life was pretty much, you know, about about thirty years uh, of life for an individual. Uh, there wasn't much progress. So the question is, where does progress come from? And I would argue that progress is a product uh, of the human mind. It is a consequence of innovation. It is a consequence of entrepreneurship. It is a concept of people taking scientific ideas and making them real in the world. We saw that in the beginning of, uh, of the Industrial Revolution, what uh, Deirdre McClatchy called the Great Enrichment. We saw that over the, we've seen that over the last 250 years. In places where people could take their ideas, make them a reality, build businesses around them, create products, create goods, in those places, humanity flourished, at least from a material perspective, did phenomenally well. Now, what makes that possible? Well, I think what makes that possible are two fundamental ideas that are ideas that come out of the Enlightenment. The two ideas that make 
the enormous success, material success that we've seen in the last 250 years, the progress we've seen, the two fundamental ideas that make this possible are one, a recognition of the efficacy of human reason. That reason is our basic means of survival, but reason is our only way to know reality and therefore to understand it and therefore to conquer it, to shape it in order to make our lives better. And of course, the identification that reason is not some collective attribute. We cannot eat for one another. There's no such thing as a collective stomach. We cannot think for one another. There's no such thing as a collective brain. Each one of us must do our own thinking. Now, it is true that we benefit from one another. We build on past knowledge. We build on other people's knowledge. But the thinking must be done by the individual in order to progress. And indeed, the other idea that comes out of the Enlightenment that makes all this possible is the idea of individualism, the sanctity of the individual, the importance, the moral importance of the individual's life. As the Declaration of Independence, the American Declaration uh, states, each individual has a moral right to pursue his happiness, right? his happiness. So the two areas are reason, ability to think, ability to understand the world, and the idea of living for oneself. These are the things that made progress and success possible. And their political manifestation is capitalism. Capitalism is the political manifestation of, a, of a, uh, a human society based on reason and on individualism. The fundamental notion in capitalism is that individuals are free to think and therefore to act on the basis of their thoughts, to innovate and then create based on those innovations to fail, to suffer the consequence of the failure, to learn from it, and to rise up and build again. The idea is that individuals are free, free of the one enemy that reason and individualism have. The enemy of reason is coercion, force, dogma, authority. Somebody telling you you have to think in a particular way. Somebody telling you you have to come to a certain conclusion. Somebody telling you you cannot do that. We don't allow it. We don't like it. Somebody regulating your actions and your thoughts. That's the enemy of reason and ultimately the enemy of individualism and their pursuit of happiness. Somebody telling me what my values must be and if they're not, is free, you know, is able to coerce me not to pursue my values. That's the enemy. Capitalism is the system of individual rights. That is the recognition that as individuals, we're all free to pursue our rational values. And freedom in this context means free of coercion, free of authority, free of force. And indeed, every society that is practiced, that is, that is allowed for this freedom, that is restrained coercion, restrained force, restrained authority, has done well, not as well as I'd like it to be because no society has ever done this perfectly. Uh, there have been, been a variety of degrees, but always to the degree that a society is free in this sense, to the degree that individuals are left free to use their mind, to pursue their own values, to pursue their own happiness, to pursue their own life, those societies, individuals tell them to be successful. They tend to create material wealth and they tend to create spiritual wealth. Now, what is the alternative? Well, there are a variety of different alternatives, and today we're debating one, Marxism. And I'm going to obviously simplify uh, what Marx said, because I've only got four minutes. But the core, in my view, of Marxism, and almost all ideas that oppose capitalism, is that they undermine both of those two principles that lead to human progress. They undermine the idea of reason, they undercut it, and they undermine and undercut the idea of individualism. Individuals, since reason is a faculty of the individual, these two are connected. It is not true that individuals know what's good for them. 
it is not true that the individual in pursuit of his own self-interest can attain happiness and attain success. It is not true that the individual should be allowed to pursue their own values. No, the individual is not framed by his own mind and his own choices. The individual is framed by the class into which he is born. He is framed by the environment around him. To some extent, by the genes that he has. He is either bourgeois and therefore, you know, exploiting, or proletarian and therefore somebody who's being exploited and who has no say in that exploitation because he is what he is and he's already a proletarian and he can't change his fate and he can't change his outcome. He can't negotiate better terms. And therefore, he must rebel against the system that oppresses him. And the only way to rebel against the system that oppresses him is to deny the ability of those others, call them bourgeois, call them whatever you want, to pursue their own values, to pursue their own happiness. Indeed, the whole setup is a setup of different groups, different collectives that have divergent interests, that have conflicting interests, indeed, that ultimately have zero-sum interests that the one success comes at other people's expense. And that the individual ultimately should be striving morally not to achieve their own success, their own happiness, their own flourishing. But that the individual's moral purpose is to serve his class. It's to serve a group defined uh, by the various Marxist groups, defined by whatever that group happens to be. It's not to serve himself. And that his interaction with other people is an interaction of exploiter or exploited, not as a trader of value for value. The assumption is of, you know, a, a growing pie, but a growing pie where some are, you know, exploiting others in order to grow it. So I know uh, I'll get some pushback on my uh, description of Marxism. And in the end, just like I said, with capitalism, to the extent that it's practiced, to that extent, it's successful. If you look at Marxism, to the extent that it's practiced, to that extent, it's a failure. The more consistently it's practiced, the more devastating the outcome. Take the Soviet Union, Mao's, China, and so on, or the Israeli kibbutz. And the less it's practiced, it's still a disaster just on a smaller scale. Um, so socialism in all its forms fail in any variety and, and, and to any extreme capitalism, the more it's practiced, the more it's successful. Finally, I want to say just this, and I know my time's up. What we have today is not capitalism. What we have today is a mixture, a mixture of capitalism and socialism, a mixture of statism and capitalism, a mixture of markets and heavy, heavy government regulations and, and redistribution of wealth. The system we have today sucks. It's no good. It's terrible. It's committing suicide. It's not going to lead to the kind of progress and flourishing and success for people in the future. It has to be revamped. It has to be rethought. And the question is, do we move towards more freedom, i.e. towards more capitalism, or do we move to, uh, towards less freedom, i.e. towards a Marxist, socialist vision of the world? Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaron. So I've seen Ashley has been dying to Mark explain why you have been wrong. So let's give her that chance. Ashley. All right. So some caveats there. You said that um, I'm one of the best Marxists. I'm not. I'm perhaps one of the most willing. <laughs> um, but I have to say that, um, yeah, I agreed with most of what you said there up until you started describing Marxism. Um, it's not a Marxism that I recognize, um, but I, I do see that that's become what, you know, that's what people understand to be Marxism. Um, so you say Marxism everywhere it's being tried. What are we trying? What's, what's there to try? What do you imagine Marx was saying? Did he have a blueprint for exactly how we're going to do things? Did he say, this is how things will be organized. This is what we must do. Um, this is how, you know, we will organize production and this is how we will uh, organize our relationships with each other. Well, to a certain extent, there is a little bit of um, 
uh, meandering in some of his work, but it isn't really like people imagine that Marxism is this blueprint or this system that is supposed to, you know, an alternative to capitalism. He spent precious little time offering an alternative to capitalism. Most of his life was spent trying to understand what capitalism is because you can, and this is actually one of the criticisms of what, uh, of what existed at the time that Marx was writing, which was utopian socialism and other kinds of um, sort of romantic anti-capitalists and um, other elements of, you know, socialism and communism that didn't follow from Marxist bent. Um, that was one of his, his criticisms Criticisms. He said that they would sit there and try to develop this perfect social organization that most perfectly matched human nature. Um, but it was a waste of time because um, you can't just imagine, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could all ride unicorns? Wouldn't it be great if we could all have X, Y, Z? What is possible comes out of what exists now. You can't just create a magical world totally anew. You have to understand what is going on in the world at the moment, how the system is currently structured, where it is going, what opportunities it's opening up. That is what you need to understand. And that's why Marx spent most of his life trying to understand capitalism, because he was trying to understand this new world that was being created every day um, within capitalism. Um, so, um, Marxism is descriptive. It is not prescriptive. By and large, it is an understanding of what capitalism is. Um, but, um, and what most people find kind of counterintuitive about Marx is that um, in many places in his work, he's actually almost giddy about the possibilities of capitalism, um, the possibilities put forward by capitalism. In some places, he heaps praise on the bourgeoisie um, for being, for accepting the task that history put into their hands by felling feudalism to the ground and creating capitalism. Um, because capitalism creates a basis of wealth production hitherto unprecedented throughout human history. Um, and it allows us to create a level of abundance with very little um, human labor. But of course, that's not its purpose. It doesn't create abundance in order to relieve us um, from human labor. It creates abundance um, through the medium of profit. So we don't do we don't um, reach our human needs directly. We do that through the medium of, of profit. And now I think what people understand when they hear Marx talking about profit or when I say these sorts of things, it's like, oh, so he thinks we shouldn't do that. Well, yes and no, um, that the profit as a driver of capitalist production, it's not that he's saying like, oh, well, we shouldn't have profit. Capitalism itself abolishes its own mode of producing profit. So this is what accounts for a lot of the, um, the kind of, uh, kind of uh, the praise that ca that Marx heaps on capitalism at the same time as the criticism, which is really confusing and difficult to grasp for a lot of people who maybe are coming to Marx's work for the first time. So, you know, the most basic example, you can look at the Communist Manifesto where he says, um, it has produced wonders that far surpass the Roman aqueducts and Gothic cathedrals. It has been the first to show what mankind can do. He celebrates capitalism and its, producti and its productivity, but then he says, but at a certain point, this um, the condition of bourgeois wealth creation starts to undermine the process or the ability to produce further wealth. Um, it becomes a fetter on progress. And just as feudalism, once perfectly fine for meeting human needs, was burst asunder by a much more productive system, so too would capitalism eventually be burst asunder by a much more productive system. Um, and so capitalism has this kind of forward push um, this um, incredible dynamism that's produced through competition. So through capitalists competing with each other, um, they compete to drive down the costs of producing things. And part of the way that they do that is by introducing machinery into the production process. And when they introduce pr uh, machinery into the production process, um, they push human labor out, um, which is... Uh, actually really good for human beings. Not so great when we're in capitalism, because when you lose your job, you lose your ability to support yourself. But for, um, but for human in the sort of grand sort of uh, scheme of human progress, it's a wonderful thing that we've conjured forth these enormous means of production, basically like these matter machines that can produce fantastic commodities that our ancestors never could have dreamed of with so little human input. But at the same time, the measuring rod of value within capitalist society is human labor. Um, and so by each individual capitalist, 
uh, raising their profit, they undermine the engine of profit. They undermine the source of profit, which is human labor. Um, and so at Eventually, what winds up happening is it becomes less and less, um, there's less and less incentive to invest um, because in order to enter into production, let's say you want to um, compete with like Google or something like that that you have to, you know, go into the production process and meet an enormous kind of capacity. Or um, if you want to compete with like, let's say a car manufacturer, you're gonna have to buy like immense means of production in order to do that. But what you're interested in is a return on your investment. And it's going to take a really, really long time to recoup the cost because over a long period of time of introducing machines into the production process, um, you wind up um, basically it, it, the cost of entering is, is enormous. And so what winds up happening is the, the avenues for productive investment get smaller and smaller. And why bother investing then? Why take the risk? You know, not only could you, if you, let's say you buy some shoe factories and you want to compete with Nike, Nike, who's been in business for a really, really long time, has enormous um, uh, means of production, enormous mach machines and so on. Um, why would you, you know, buy all of that? And then at the end of the day, maybe never recoup the cost. The cost, recouping the cost is going to take a really long time because the rate of profit is very low. Um, but you may never do so because you may simply be, uh, you know, you may not be able to compete. Um, you may not be able to just compete with what Nike is producing. So why, why take that risk? So it becomes logical then to try and find other avenues for investment that aren't productive. And so what we see, what we've seen over the last few decades is investment in enormous bubbles. Like it makes sense. Why would I take the risk to produce something that's actually like good for human beings and human progress? I can just give you know, loan money to students and they have to pay it back. It makes sense to do that. And this is one of the things that um, makes Marxism actually um, one of the more humanist approaches because his understanding of crisis, his understanding of the ultimate undermining of the engine of progress within capitalism doesn't rely on human greed. It doesn't rely on human error. It doesn't rely on people being bad or mean and nasty. It starts with the exact same premises of bourgeois economists, the rational individual. And it's people, it's the system in its very proper functioning, even in an ideal sense of if it prop, if it functioning just the way that people say that it should, not people making mistakes, that's what leads to crisis. So at a certain point, what is a wonderful system that's very, very productive and pr produces the basis of a whole new world in which we can create with very little, um, with very little labor, um, actually turns around and starts to, you know, the, the profit motive um, starts to weaken and there's less and less uh, incentive um, to, to invest. Um, okay, so um, I think I, I went into way more detail than I was expecting there. Um, but in what other way can we think about, so Marxism is an attempt to understand capitalism and what capitalism is creating. That is a basis of wealth and abundance that could provide a future in which I no longer have to sell my freedom to somebody for 40 hours a week. So you mentioned like, what is the enemy of freedom? It's coercion. It's not having the right, it's being told what your values should be. Hi, I sell that. I sell my values for 40 hours a week. And so do you know, many, many more other, more people. And also um, more hours than that, if they can get them. Um, I, I can't, think what I want. And increasingly, people are actually demanding that even outside of those 40 hours, I should embody the values of my employer. It's like creeping out everywhere. Um, and so I, I, if you have a world of wealth and abundance that is produced with very little human labor, you can have what capitalists today have. We have a small portion of the population that are able to live the life that actually all human beings can live. We have that capacity. Capitalism has produced that capacity where they can work if they want to, but they don't have to. Um, all human beings can live like that. We can all work if we want to, but we don't have to um, because automation gets to a point where it takes such little labor. Um, now within capitalism, that's quite bad. It's quite bad for workers because you get thrown out of work and so on. It's quite bad for the overall profit rate, but it is quite good for human progress. And that's why Marx is um, so excited about capitalism in some places in his work. Um, 
But in what sense can we think about Marxism as a system? Well, it's a system that attempts to understand the movement of history. So it's historical. Marx tries to understand um, how feudalism, event out of feudalism emerged capitalism and how some things that existed within that system kind of in many ways carry on into capitalism, but in an obscure form. So when you were uh, a feudal serf, you worked some of the time for the feudal lord and you worked some of the time for the capitalist, uh, for the capitalist, <laughs> for yourself, for your family. Um, you work some of that, so it's obvious. You grow your produce, you see it right in front of you, you cart it over to the feudal lord, it's gone. Within uh, capitalism, that is obscured. So we have uh, the wage relation. So you are paid the value of your labor. Uh, you are paid um, the value of your, of your labor power. At, at, but the use value of your labor is that you produce more above and beyond what you are paid for. Um, so this actually, this, this actually opened up an enormous realm of freedom for human beings, because when you were a serf, you died a serf. When you are born in capitalism, who knows what you can become? Um, and, but that fundamental kind of exploitation still remains there. We are freer than we have ever been, but we are not fully free because we still have to work a certain amount of time above and beyond what is necessary to replace our wages, to replace our means of, uh, our, our means of life of, you know, whatever it takes to get us to come back into the production process the next day but we also work a certain amount beyond that um, for someone else I always say to my students you work a little bit of time and by the way I also teach bourgeois economics I don't do a one-sided thing um, but you when I'm teaching Marxism I always say you work some of the time for the for yourself not for yourself but to replace your wages and you work some of the time for the capitalist you work some of the time so that Paris Hilton can go on a yacht um, and we can have a situation in which um, we are um, we don't have to do that. And capitalism is creating it and it's creating the forces of its own destruction. Not inevitably, of course, we can have, we can do all sorts of terrible things. We can move into it like neo-feudalism. Neo we can have uh, all sorts of dystopian futures, but there is one future of possibility that is created by capitalism. And how do we seize that? By having human uh, rationality, human, the ca capacity for human reason, human freedom, and having a non-negotiable thirst for wealth <laughs> that we deserve. And when people say, no, you can't have that, you say, no, I see it. Capitalism creates it every day and I want it. I want it all. Greed is actually good. Thank you very much, Ashley. So hopefully by now the differences in the panel are clear. So we're going to proceed in the Q&A. Just a reminder to our audience, you can ask questions via Super Chat. For the Super Chat to go through the filter of Razi, it has to be polite and it has to be a question which is respectful to our audience. Again, it takes guts to come and play an away game and stand up against Yaron. So we have to be, we have to be polite and we have to be kind. So also another reminder from from next Monday, ARC UK is bringing more stuff. So we, we have next week the premiere of HBTV, which is the Harry Binswanger TV. So philosopher Harry Binswanger, who at the moment has the Harry Binswanger letter, now he's also going to have a TV, let's say, program in ARC UK. So another reason, again, to support ARC UK. And also just to tell people that Next week, the discussion of Yaron is going to be with Zubi. You probably know Zubi from Twitter. And the topic is tradition, good or bad? So let's go to the first question. I also have a lot of questions here, but I'm going to give priority to Super Chats because we are happy to sell our labor to the Super Chatters, as someone said. So Super Chat from Mario Lin. Are we, so the question, I, if I understand, goes to Ashley, but I also want to take your own stake. Are we not free because we have to work? So, and I add my caveat. Does the fact that, Ashley, you said we have to sell our labor, does yeah, this take power. away our freedom? And then what is the definition of freedom for you? Let's start with Ashley and then we go to Yaron. Or shall we start with Yaron till Ashley takes notes? Oh, I can go ahead. It's up to you. Okay, let's start with Ashley then. 
Um, we are not free um, because, yeah, because we have to work, because we have to sell our labor power, our ability to work to someone. So you can be, you know, above and beyond feudalism, you can be way more. Like under, under feudalism, you were born a serf, you died a serf. Under capitalism, you can be whatever you want, so long as you can convince a capitalist to pay you to be that thing. Um, but in a world where you have, let's say, full automation, where, you know, you're like, comrade Alexa, I'd like my, you know, meals delivered at 6pm, then you can do whatever you want. And, and actually, capitalism is creating this all the time, because as the labor that goes into making something goes down and down, uh, further and further down, the um, the separation between yourself and your product starts to disappear. So you can make music now on a laptop really, really easily, and and, and almost anybody can do it. Um, and of course, the value of that is is quite low, but people do it anyway because they they really love to do that. And that's that kind of freedom that gets produced within capitalism that also doesn't work within the logic of capitalism. So, Yaron, uh, what is freedom? Why is it not, or is it impaired by you having to sell your labor? And also, does the fact that you can create stuff for free in your laptop and put it out there for free or sell it for free, does this undermine the base? The, uh, does this undermine the essence of capitalism? Well, it doesn't undermine the essence of capitalism. It comes out of the essence of capitalism. Okay, it comes outside of out of the essence of capitalism. Okay. So, I mean, where do you start? Um, it, it, it's, it surprises me constantly the extent to which uh, people buy into the utopian notion of the Garden of Eden. I mean, it, it, this is an incredibly powerful story uh, that has become part of the, the psyche. That is, there's, there's some kind of ideal out there where manna just fall from heaven. You don't have to do anything. You can do whatever you feel like doing. To hell with human reason. Who needs that? That's the tree of knowledge. You don't want to eat out of that. You, and you just, you just consume. You're just a consuming machine. That's not human life. That's not flourishing. That's not happiness. That's not success. That's not anything. Uh, labor is not uh, torture. Labor is how we change the world to fit our needs. We are a being in a particular environment. If we just plop there and rely on our emotions like they do in the Garden of Eden, we will die. That's reality. And therefore, we are in a position to change the world to fit our needs to make things better. And we work to do that. Feudalism was an awful way to do that because it was zero sum and there was no progress and human beings got stuck, as was every system before capitalism. So it's not a progression of systems. It's systems that didn't work forever, for 100,000, 200,000 years. And then we heard on something that actually works. The only thing that's ever worked for human beings, and that is capitalism, this, this successful creation. Now, so, so there's this fixation of machines will just feed it to me. Who created the machines? Who built them? Now, again, Marx is completely wrong. Laborers don't create almost anything. Labor is simple. Labor is interchangeable. Labor has very little value. That's a reality. Where do machines come from? Machines come from a few particular individuals that have the imagination, the gall, the guts, the, 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 the energy, the, the passion to organize uh, capital and labor in order to make their reality real. In all, of, in all of the history of the last 250 years, there are very few cases where a bunch of laborers arrived in a particular place and said, okay, let's build something and built it. I mean, maybe you can find one example here and there in some, some commune in Spain or something, but it doesn't happen. The fact is that progress, innovation, ingenuity, technology, everything, involves an individual's mind. Now, Marxists say, to hell with that. That's not of any value. The people who really create the value are those workers down there. No, those workers are basically doing what somebody had the audacity to imagine could be done. That person is not exploiting them. You could argue that they're exploiting him. I won't argue that because I don't believe that. But to the extent that anybody's getting the short part of the stick, 
you know, somebody like, uh, I was going to use Bill Gates, but Bill Gates is not a good name to use these days, uh, given that he, his troubles. But, um, you know, somebody like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates created trillions of dollars of wealth in the world, created as individuals because of their ideas, because of their ability to organize, quote, labor programmers, managers, laborers to build the machine, uh, uh, supply chains, they created trillions and trillions and trillions of value in the world. Some of that value was captured by labor. They got paid for everything that they produced. They got paid based on the amount that they added to the final product. Bill Gates, I don't know, got paid in a sense, $100 billion. <laughs> but he created trillions. I mean, he's way underpaid, way underpaid in comparison to the workers. Any one of those workers could have been replaced. Find another Bill Gates, find another Steve Jobs, find another Larry Ellison. That's what's interesting, that's what's unique. And the whole, you know, hopefully there'll be a question about investment because the whole view of investment is wrong and, and is not reflective of reality at all. So can I ask the panelists, we have such a good series of super chats, so, Instead of dialogue, let's try to give answer only to the super chats because they're really, really good. So second super chat comes from Bonnie. And the question is, what in essential term was Marx's view of human nature? And to put this question into some context, so Yaron mentioned that capitalism is the system that is in a way in accordance to human nature, that we need reason and freedom in order to survive. And If I've understood well from discussions that I've had with Ashley in the past, we've had this disagreement on whether there is such a thing as human nature and whether you can build a system based on human nature. So, Ashley, can you tell us what is Marx's view of human nature and how do you view the topic and whether we can build a political system based on human nature? Excellent question, Bonnie, by the way. Thank you. Okay, so Marx's view of human nature is its ability to create its own nature. So uh, he writes, uh, it is the everlasting nature imposed condition that man must work on the world. And in so doing, we work on ourselves. Um, we have different ideas because we create different things in the world. Um, we are the only animals that um, create the conditions of our own life. And in so doing, revolutionize the societies in which we live. Um, and we, um, and that, that makes us different from animals. So that means that you can't, that's one of the reasons why you can't put forward a kind of blueprint for society, um, what it's going to be and the kind of essential human nature and all these human requirements and so on, because by creating things in the world, different ways of doing things, we create different ways of flourishing. What I need now to survive is fundamentally different than what people needed a thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. The ideas that I have in my head are fundamentally different because we have different ways of doing things. So I mentioned feudalism, for example. So under feudalism, you had a fundamentally different idea of human nature. It, people thought, you know, it is in the nature of the serf to be a serf. It is in the nature of the king to be a king. It's in the nature of the slave to be a slave. They thought that people were just born like that because there was such a rigid kind of um, concentration of wealth within this class structure. It didn't really change. And that's how it was. You know, people, it really did appear as though people were born at surf and that was like inside of them. That was their essence. But then capitalism came and that bl and blew the whole thing open. And suddenly someone could be born a peasant and wind up in New York, you know, as a you know, uh, a baron, or not so bad word to use, but you know, a, a, a capitalist, um, something fundamentally different. And so then we have fundamentally different ideas in our heads about human nature, that we start to have this idea of like, fundamentally qualities of human beings that we have uh, a basis of, well, what is it that makes us all human then? What is the essence of human beings? That question starts to pop up. And we say, well, it is the essence of human beings to have reason. Um, And then we have science that comes out of that and so on that, you know, I have a mind and you have a mind and I can show you the same thing and you're going to see it and you're going to come to the same conclusion as I do. And all of these things come because we revolutionize the way that we do things. And so you can't say, oh, uh, in order to have human flourishing, we need this, 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 and develop this kind of list of things. And now let's create this society which hits all of these things. No, you see what's happening in the world and it is changing. It is changing. And we can say, Well, there are some things about these changes that I want to hold on to. And there are some things that I, I want to push back against. So there is this 
enormous pull backwards. So we have a problem, let's say we have a crisis, an economic crisis, and there's this backward pull, you know, this crisis warns us that there's something going on here, that this system is um, inherently crisis bound. And there are people who want to say, okay, that's fine. Let's, let's default to the negative side of that, the, the regressive side. Who needs economic growth? Money doesn't make you happy. And then there's the progressive side of that, which says, well, hold on a second. How can we have a crisis? Why can't I eat when the crisis is that we've produced too much and not too much for human need, but too much for some asshole to make a profit from? So that, that reveals to you that this system is not an absolute system for the creation of wealth, but has come into conflict with the further production of that wealth. And then we hold on to that and we say, I want to have that progressive side. How can we have maintained the progressive force of capitalism, these enormous means of production? And how can we um, turn them to human ends, to human needs directly rather than indirectly, which creates these problems that we have, you know, crisis and the backward motion and so on? Just to make sure we don't switch the discussion to the issue of crisis of capitalism, because I know both of you have, we, that could be a different episode. So, Yaron, issue of human nature. So, basically, Ashley say, says that, in a way, is it that you're a bit like a central planner, that you say the, se the, the best society needs to have this and this and this and this? Um, I didn't understand the way you phrased the question. So, uh, but I'll say this, uh, human nature is, I mean, Ashley hit on it in the middle there. Uh, that is that it's, it's human beings have reason. Human beings are the rational animal. Aristotle hit on this a long time ago. If we paid attention to him 2,500 years ago, we wouldn't have had a dark ages. Uh, it's, it's a negation of that idea. It's a negation of reason uh, that leads us to, to dark ages and to, and to dark, uh, dark means. Um, and, and yes, I'm, I'm all for, we have different ideas, we have different things. So yes, leave people free to do it. And you know what, if Ashley comes up with the idea that, um, uh, you know, to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability, um, then great, go found a commune and do that. That's the beauty of capitalism. The beauty of capitalism is you can start a worker's owned co-op. You can start any kind of structure you want, free of intervention, free of coercion. You can do that the flip side, right? Any kind of politicization of Marxism involves somebody telling me what I can and cannot do. Somebody telling me what kind of relationship I can have with Nikos and what kind of relationship I can't. He's not allowed to be my employee, even if he wants to. Capitalism is something that when you protect people from coercion, authority, um, you leave them free to use their mind, to pursue their own values, emerges from the choices people make. It doesn't, it isn't shaped and constructed and put together. All we do from the top is protect people's freedom and then let people, let whatever emerges emerges. And if it turns out that what emerges, I mean, this would be shocking, but if it turns out what emerges is from each according to his ability to each according to his means, so be it. But I would, I'm, I'm willing to put down everything I own uh, as a guarantee that that would not happen. So would I though, so would I. So that's the thing is that what Marx is saying is with, the, from, with that line is that he's actually criticizing another socialist group at the time who had put forward that as a slogan, as a demand. He says, you can't just put that forward as a demand. You have to have a certain amount of development before you can ever get to that point. Yeah, I'm and it will, and it will never, that. but it will never just happen. It will never just happen and unless we dogmatically hold on to certain values that are indeed produced within capitalism against the forces of capitalism itself. People, let's not interrupt each other because there are... So the next super chat is as if we ordered it. It's exactly on this, it's exactly on this point and it's directed to Ashley. So the question is, what's stopping Marxists from starting their own towns slash societies and carrying out their ideology? Why does it appear that they need to parasitize a functioning yet imperfect capitalist society. Ashley. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, did, what was the end of that question? Why do we have to parasitize? So, so basically the thing is why, why do you have to expect from the capitalists to build the means of production to take them and why don't you build your own society somewhere else? Well, we tried that, <laughs> and it was, you know, a constant, uh, constantly at war. Um, and constantly under destruction. One of the problems that w that faced the USSR was that you couldn't have, you can't just have like a little commune where everybody lives like Smurfs. That's not what 
that's not the idea. That's not the goal. That's not, nobody wants to go back to any kind of past where we imagine that every, that our relationships were with each other were fully developed. What we want to do is create a situation where the, what capitalism has created by alienating human beings from the products of their labor, by separating human beings. So in the past, let's say in the Smurfs, you created something and you consumed it directly. Um, capitalism separates you from the product of your labor. You don't consume it directly. You make a product. You have no claim to that product. It goes to the capitalist. You get wages and you buy your means of subsistence somewhere else. And so you are separated from the product. But that split allows them to come back together in a higher form um, through development of technology and so on. So as I mentioned before, you were split from, you know, making music or whatever, and it was maybe that's a bad example. But and then it comes back together in a higher form where you can think it and you can create it in a much more technologically advanced way that was possible that was possible before. So it's a whole movement of the entirety of the society. That's what we are trying to understand. Um, and uh, what happened with the USSR was they recognized that you, they had to have a revolution in many, many different countries. You can't have just like a little, tiny little commune where you all live like Smurfs and live in your own imaginations. It's basically suicide. Um, there had to be some kind of global movement or else you would you would never be able to move beyond capitalism. You would have you would you would have to trade with outside countries. Those countries would still be capitalist. Therefore, you would re maintain the money form, um, and so all of the contradictions of capitalism would be maintained. Um, and so there, one, there isn't some wonderful utopia that. I have dreamed up in my mind or that Marx dreamed up in his mind that could just be put into place in some little village. Um, it is about the whole movement of society and about trying to take control of that movement um, and try to direct it toward human ends di directly, because right now it is indirectly. We don't produce directly for human need. Um, we produce for profit and meet human needs in that way. But if there are needs in the world that can't be met profitably, then those needs will go unmet. If there are problems in the world that we can't deal with profitably, we like climate change, for example, then we can't deal with that issue. And the idea is that we have the ability to do all of these things. We have the ability to deal with all sorts of problems, but because we deal with problems indirectly, we can't deal with them. And so the idea is it's a whole, it's trying to understand the whole movement of history and trying to direct it consciously to human ends. It's not an idea of us all living harmoniously with each other. And one thing that I wanted to mention too is that it's also about the freedom of the individual. Um, it's not about living for each other. Right now, I live for other people. <laughs> That's what I do. I live for, I am part of a production process that is very much entwined with other people. I spend whatever it is, I mentioned before, 40 hours a week or more if they can get me to, to live for someone else, someone else's needs, someone else's things that they dreamt up. I want to live for myself and not having to be involved in, in um, wage labor eventually, the abolition of wage labor, which is seems to be the natural process of capitalism um, by removing human beings from the production process will eventually free us to do that. So it's about the whole movement of history and to free the individual, as uh, Oscar Wilde said, from that horrible necessity of having to live for other people. Yaron. I mean, this is magic thinking. I mean, this is the negation of reality and negation of reason. It, it, technology just happens it just appears there. Machines are going to produce all our goods. They're just there, and I'm going to be able to do whatever the hell I want. It doesn't just appear there. It comes wait, 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 as a process wait, 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 of capitalist competition. Create, in order to get any of this, you're going to have to create values. You're going to have to create values for other people. And there are going to be all kinds of ways in which you do that, all kinds of voluntary associations that you're going to create with other people in order to produce values on different scales. And, if, and different people produce different sizes of values. Uh, different quantity of values, different importance of values, different, uh, uh, you know, the, the, both spiritually and materially, this is going to be different. Therefore, people are going to be different. They're going to be able to afford different things. It's not. And this idea that all our needs are going to be produced automatically is absurd because all our needs have to be produced by somebody. Yes, we can build a machine for need one, but need one only creates 500 other needs that then we have to build machines to create them. Somebody has to build those machines. Somebody has to have the idea of how to build those machines. Somebody has to write the music. In order for you to make a living off of that music, somebody has to buy that music. It has to be a value to somebody. That's all capitalism. None of that. None of that is Marxism. All of that depends on private property. Marx explicitly says that communism is the abolition of private property. He's, not, he's for the abolition of private property and property. Because capitalism abolishes it itself. 
But it doesn't. That's all. That's all complete nonsense. That, that's not what capitalism is, and it's not how capitalism has evolved, and it's not what we're seeing. It has. Okay. Ever, so where happens. does automation but, come from? I'm just curious. Where does automation come from in all of this? What's the driver of automation? Automation. The driver of automation is profit, but but automation doesn't destroy jobs. That's bizarre. There are more jobs on planet Earth today than in any point in human history, and yet there's more automation today in, on planet Earth than ever before. And I will again. Uh, bet anything that in 50 years with all the robots and everything else, there will be more jobs. There'll be more work in 50 years than there is today in spite of all the robots. So automation only creates more opportunities to create and to build and to make in a variety of collaborative uh, efforts. And I consider corporation and a business of wage labor, a collaborative cooperative effort. That's only expanding. It doesn't, it's not going to go away. Machines are never going to produce the things that you need. Human beings are always going to have to add something to make those machines happen. They're going to have to fix the machines, program the machines and everything else. That's quote labor, labor of the mind, not labor. So what we're eradicating is physical labor. That's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. And we're starting to eradicate certain types of mental labor. But that only frees us up to do other kinds of labor. We're always going to be working. Yes. We're always going to be do something productive. And, and, but only, only within the context of capitalism. Again, capitalism is a system that says that you do what you want to do. And you, it leaves you alone to do whatever you want to do. If you want to go back and be a subsistent farmer, get a plot of land, and, and you can connect with the products that you sow, you can eat. You can do that under capitalism, right? Nobody stops you. Um, it, you're not wage slavery because you can stop being a wage. You can start your own business. You can go and be a farmer. You can do a million different well, things I, with your how life. How would I buy wait, the wait, land wait, to people, be a wait, farmer, wait, wait. though? Wait. Well, you can. I mean, capitalism has provided you even with that. You can get a mortgage. I mean, capitalism. And by the way, all those laborers who are today laborers used to be farmers. Labor never existed until capitalism. Capitalism created labor. It created, and, and it's entrepreneurs who created labor. There's no labor without entrepreneurs. But, and, and I created I labor in relation to the, oh, the capitalists. Wait, so, wait, sorry, people. We have three more. We have yes, three more. I have to say this. I have to say this. I think it's wrong to whitewash the USSR, um, uh, you know, and, and pretend that it was somehow uh, engaged, you know, the problem was war. Yes, it, it, you know, no, Marx no, I'm, I'm not whitewashing the USSR. I was just mentioning that. I, I mean, was just mentioning that this, it has to be, it was doomed. It was yes, it has forever to be doomed by the fact that it could not. It, yeah, it could you not. have to oppress everybody because in a small group, a suicide, then they look outside and they see people doing better than them. You have to make everybody miserable in order for people to accept their misery within communism. That is the, that is the reality. So yes, it has to be international because it can't be, it can't be localized because it's a failure local or, you know, no matter the size. It's I, going to be. A can I just clarify one point? It's can not we, that people sorry, aren't going to have jobs. It's that the the rate of return on investment gets lower over time, and we see doesn't. that we're There's seeing no it does. There's no tons evidence. of evidence of that. There's no evidence. I'm a finance professor. Believe me, there's no evidence of that. I mean, if you'd invested in Amazon, you wouldn't say that the rate of return on investment is low. Indeed, if there is a rate of investment that's low right now, it's because of of a lack of capitalism. That is the reason it re they return. I mean, that's it's obvious. There's, there's. Uh, why is there why? a lack of capitalism? Why is there this desire to? Because why is there a desire to move away Sorry, from people, these productive Sorry, people. If you talk together, people cannot listen to you. Sorry. If you so talk away okay. from capitalism, there's a desire away from capitalism because Marx, like Christianity before it, rejects the fundamental assumptions that make capitalism possible. That is, there's a rejection in our society of reason and individualism. Um, if, if, and and there's, there's this, uh, there's this uh, idea that we can centrally plan an economy. That is the, So there's no crisis of capitalism of overproduction. It's never happened. It's, it, no economist actually thinks that. That is bizarre. Um, and, and, there's there's actually, and, and there is no problem of low return on investment. The problem is that there are not enough of ideas. And the reason there are not enough ideas, because if I have an idea today, I have to get permission to start a company. So I have to get permission to apply the idea. So whole realms of human innovation have been segmented off because of statism, because the state has become 
uh, the, the regulator of human ingenuity and human ideas and human innovation. So more oh, capitalism. Wait, 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 why. sorry, why would people. They do that? Wait, sorry, so people. Strange. We have three more super chats. Because they want power. I mean, yeah, on, that, one minute. Exactly. See, so you all you have to fall back on something about human beings. You see, so it winds up being human beings and, and, have bad ideas. Exactly. It leads but, them to make bad choices, which exactly. leads them away so from capital. You throw capitalism. out the human subject. You don't actually believe that people are capable of freedom because they. I'm a, I believe in people are capable they of mess, freedom, but I believe I believe they need to because be. That's the only way you can explain why things happen. It's always by bad people. Sorry, it's people. people, people. Wait, I, wait, 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 wait. People have to. You know, have to sorry. Go ahead. You want a deterministic history, which is what Marx is. I don't believe in determinism. It's not I determinism. There are many different ways that things could go. I didn't say why. That we're I mean, definitely it's, going it's, this direction. Say evolution we're of definitely. I mean, Marx didn't believe that. We're. De I didn't say that we're definitely going to socialism. I actually said that there are many different paths that that could actually happen if we. Okay. Don't sorry. Hold on sorry. To I have been to Rob's so Sorry. 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 We have three more super chats in three minutes. So we're going to do it battle of idea style. I'm going to throw all three questions and you pick whichever you want. Okay. So let's respect our super chatters and put their questions out there. So question number one, if my life no longer benefits others, ask Fabian, is it still okay? So basically, he, if I understand it, this means, is it okay to live for yourself or does this go against something that Ashley said? Second question, if there were no employers slash capitalists, what do you think people would be doing to survive? Farming, hunting, or hunting, gathering? To what era do you want civilization to go back to? Back. Next question, uh, is it possible that people find meaning and purpose in being productive at their work? Is it possible that people find meaning and purpose in being productive at their work. Someone agrees with Yaron that automation will create more jobs. Okay, sorry, two more super chats. <laughs> oh, okay. The point about automation wasn't about jobs, it's about lowering the profit rate. Okay, one, one second, sorry. Uh, someone says, thanks to both Yaron and Ashley for this. I haven't got a question, thank you so much. And the last super chat, Ashley, do you enjoy your work or do you only work as an onerous duty to help others? Okay, I've thrown a lot on the table. Uh, I would really appreciate if, as a respect to our super chatters, we deal with all these questions in the very few minutes that we have left. So try to be quick and uh, try to... S let's start with Ashley, since most questions were addressed at here. Pick whichever you want, but try to cover them all. Okay, is it okay to live for yourself? Yes, that's the goal. And to remove the barriers from being able to do that um, and... Uh, to go to hold on to the progressive kind of potential for freedom that's made possible within capitalism by um, creating wealth and so on. Um, but th that's not the purpose of wealth within capitalism. It's just a byproduct. Um, but the goal would be, yes, to live for ourselves, to uh, remove us from having to live for other people, which is what we do now. If there were no capitalists, what would we be doing? We'd be trying to eliminate human labor from the production process directly. We would keep the entire product of our labor. Um, we would be working toward a situation where, which is what capitalism's ex capitalists experience right now. They can work if they want to, but they don't have to. That would be how everyone would live. You could work if you want to, but you don't have to. So you can be, you can spend, you know, a certain part of your day being a machine tender and think up new um, new kinds of machines and people do this all the time now you know as as they get you know there isn't any incentive there didn't used to be any incentive to make to become a YouTube star people just did it because they liked it and now you know they they do it to become stars but I mean there's nothing wrong with wanting remuneration I'm just saying that you know you would you could work if you want to but you don't have to you can sit on your ass if you want you could be whatever <laughs> um People find meaning and purpose in work. Yes, lots of people do, and we tend to admire those people. I think that's probably why we love football footballers and musicians because they get to do something that is fully creative and they really enjoy it. Some of them wind up being um, like human, tra like human trafficked, and that kind of thing. Um, but we tend to admire them because at least we imagine that they are doing something that they love, whereas. Most people are not really able to do that. I think if there was no coercion, there was no, you know, you weren't 
pursued by the threat of starvation. We now have welfare states and so on that take some of the um, surplus value and give it to people. So you don't necessarily, doesn't mean you starve, but generally um, you have to work. And most people, if you didn't have that coercion, you'd be doing something pretty different with your life. I would very tend to ask what's the definition of coercion, but Okay. I, I if I don't work, I'm going to die. <laughs> I guess we have the welfare state. It can be coercion. That That's that. the natural state of man. If they don't work, you die. That's the natural state. No, because I can't even go out. If you at look every at, point in time. At look any at, point for in time, example, the grapes of wrath. These people, when they got thrown off their land, they kept looking at the land saying, look, there are orange trees over there. Why can't I just eat the oranges? And they were like, because the somebody planted those. Somebody put in labor into those orange plants and they're not yours. No, they, no, they consume, did that. They, let me finish. They if even, you consume, they, they, if you they consume planted those oranges. oranges. If they you actually, consume, they planted you all of that the stuff oranges, they people, if you talk, and they were Sorry, wait, 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 wait. If you consume the oranges, then no oranges next time. No, so no, the and then the worst part is they even the killed the pigs without the pigs because they can't be sold. There are no oranges anymore. I mean, it's such magical thinking and where production comes from. And how production happens and where machines come from and where oranges come from. It's, it's, it really is... There are products of human labor. We agree really on is, that. Marx it, was delusional 150 years ago. Um, but really, I mean, when you think about so. the need for the human mind to produce these things, to plan, to think, to innovate, and then to ascertain that, yes, there's surplus value. There's no surplus value. Um, the value goes to those who actually contribute to the production. But let me, let me, let me be clear on something. Marx would have found it bizarre, the idea that human beings should live for themselves. And if you don't believe me, read a, a powerful essay that he wrote, uh, my favorite piece uh, that Marx wrote. It's, it's on the Jewish question, where he lamb blessed the Jews for what? For living for themselves, for, for pursuing their own well-being, for pursuing their own monetary well-being, which he considered uh, evil and, and, and horrific, and his accusation against the Christians was they were becoming Jewish because they were coming too much in pursuit of their own well-being. So no, there's nothing in Marx other than his ultimate utopia, where everybody lives for themselves because everything is available uh, labor-free. There's nothing in Marx that suggests that you should live for yourself. Indeed, he recognized the fact that, the, that, the, uh, that in the transition to this ultimate utopia, many people would have to be killed. Uh, many people would have to be uh, eliminated. Read his letters with Engels, where they talk about different people and different classes and what needs to happen to those classes. They, those in those letters, uh, in I, the that's literally the only thing that people like you in read. The he says those people are going to kill each other. And, in and, the transition to... And so liberals said the exact same thing about Nazis and communists, that they're just going to kill each other and we should step back. Not a nice position to have, but that's no. Something. It was the inevitable. The inevitability of history was going to be that in order to achieve the utopia, certain people had to die, uh, because in the they name, would, in the he name says of, he literally in the name says the politics, that they that these but, two warring groups were going to kill each other off, and then he says good riddance. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then you like I don't know. But he says, he says more than that, and there's more than one letter. And, oh, good. But, 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 but look, like, literally if, the if only thing. Disassociate violence from Marxism is wrong. Marxism necessitates violence because it doesn't recognize the rights of the individual to, to live free based on his own values, based on his own choices. Uh, it, 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 it forces the individual to live under a certain context. The abolition of private property is about abolition. Not the phasing out of private property, the abolition, which means the taking away of private property, the taking away of people's hard work, of taking away the people's innovations, of the, cre the, the, the creation of, of people's minds. It necessitates violence. Co uh, Marxism necessitates coercion and violence. And the idea that it is coercive, that, that coercion involves, I, I have to work, is, is ridiculous because the state of nature in which man lives is that he has to work in order to in order to survive. Yes, he has to work in order to survive, forced. but he has to it's within a particular context. Is, is the ability to, to work directly, to the ability to work directly for yourself was taken away historically, and so no, the, nobody took it away. There are plenty of people who subsistence farm through, around the world through the process of primitive accumulation. Plenty people of people. All, to, plenty of I'm people sorry, have you never food. heard of like indigenous people around the world? Like your ability to live off of the land was was taken away. Literally, people were taken off that land. Shipped Most to another 
people place, left the said, land because because there was so much. Ninety nine percent of people left the land because there was so much more opportunity elsewhere. But because capitalism created opportunities for people to live a much better life than the really awful life of indigenous people. So the people, for for instance, who were taken, who were caribou hunters, taken and said, "Oh, now you're fishermen." Uh, Sorry, we have we have they, more super they, chats. Oh, you know what that I would mean, be really? Good. I mean, all people were indigenous people once, and people have chosen to give up the poverty of subsistence living in order to advance. In order, I mean, to that's like live you're just life. making things up. Like that's just literally not what happened. Okay. <laughs> anyway. By the way, I don't think there's any disagreement that Yaron would not approve of people being kicked off their land with violence or someone taking their land. So I think this disagreement is not uh, very substantial. So, okay, two more super chats. Actually, three more super oh, chats, oh, and then we're done. We had an hour. We can't keep. We can't go indefinitely, guys. Okay, two, three more minutes. Okay, we finish at ten past. Solid end at ten past, and please don't interrupt each other. So. Uh, the state blocks ingenuity, says Gail, so we have not seen the amazing results we would if government got out of the way. Super chat from Gullwings. Ashley, for the people that will be sitting on there, who will feed them? Will others be forced to provide for them? And the emphasis here is on the forced to provide for them. And last super chat. Marx also mocked Max Stirner for his, quote, egoism. Uh, let me comment here. Max Stirner's egoism is to be mocked. So uh, uh, he's he's really bad. Don't confuse Stirner's egoism with Rand's egoism. Okay. So basically, there's one question there. Uh, what if the people who sit on their couches does someone have to be forced to feed them? And what if they don't want to feed them? No. So the idea is that that will never happen until the productive forces are developed and advanced enough. It's not like you'd be like, OK, now we're at a point where everyone just sits on their asses. And by the way, there are loads of people in the world who sit on their asses right now. They can work if they want to, but they don't have to. And lots of people don't. And who feeds them? I do. I do. When I work, <laughs> I work a certain amount of time for myself and a certain amount of time above and beyond what I'm paid in wages. If that weren't the case, if I cost more than I make for the employer, I would be fired. Um, so that's what I do. I already work for people who don't work. Um, they can work, but they don't have to. Um, and so that would never happen until we get to a point where the productive level, and I'm sure that we're at that point right now, if we had a, uh, if we had sorted out some way of organizing production without the law of value, and we have never sorted that out. We do not have an alternative. There is no alternative to capitalism. I will agree with that. We, we have everything that we tried Every time we tried to overcome capitalism, we failed. And uh, but that's the thing is that Marxism isn't like, oh well, let's just go do this other thing. That it's an alternative. I think this is why people are sometimes very confused by me. I can sing the praises of capitalism, you know, because I don't think that I need to tell people capitalism is this terrible system in order to overcome it. I what terrifies me is that capitalism is going through an extraordinarily destructive phase. It is destroying the basis of its own. Um, wealth creation, and there is nothing to replace it. To restore the profit rate, we can do all sorts of things. We have a, a very a destructive crisis right now. People go out of business and you can buy them up you know, cheaply and so on, but you can also have war. You can like flatten two continents and build them again. That's really, that restores the profit rate. That's what scares me, that there is nothing to replace it. Okay, thank you, Ashley. So last word to Yaron, we went over time. This shouldn't happen again, but the discussion was too interesting. Yaron, your final words. Yes. I'll, I'll just say, uh, you know, a big, a big disagreement here is the labor theory of value. Um, I, I think workers get as much, if not more, than what they should get. Uh, and uh, certainly they get as much as what the alternatives provide for them. I think that business owners, middle managers, all the people that Marx likes to condemn, uh, 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 as... Uh, properly paid, at least in a capitalist society. Granted, we don't live in one right now, but generally uh, entrepreneurs are uh, underpaid, not overpaid, if anything. Uh, the idea that Steve Jobs made too much money or Bill Gates made too much money is absurd given how much they contributed to labor. How much? Because they created labor. There is no labor without them. Um, and um, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with this with Ashley. I too am worried where we're heading. We're heading towards uh, some kind of uh, uh, 
feudalism, uh, state-controlled, so-called state-controlled capitalism, which is not capitalism, but another form of socialism, whether it's fascism or socialism, or how you want to define it, or feudalism, how do you want to define it? We're heading in that direction. There's no question. We're heading in that direction because of uh, people not understanding what capitalism is and the virtue and beauty of it. And because capitalism is constantly being undermined in our political system. And I think the reason for that is, is because we, the capitalists, have not done a good enough job defending it and, and explaining it. And that the, 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 the anti-reason, anti-individualism, anti-egoism uh, philosophies out there are so deeply rooted in our society that it's hard to unroot them, but that is our job. Our job is to unroot those and, and get rid of those ideas so that we could have capitalism. And capitalism doesn't get replaced. It is the system that exists forever and, and under which we all flourish and under which we all achieve some kind of utopian uh, or, or perfect existence one day. Okay, let me wait, wait, <laughs> wait. No. trying to explain. Here's the, can I just agree with Ayn Rand on something? That people are actually observing something real happening in the world. They didn't just conjure up these ideas out of nowhere and be like, oh, geez, you know, why don't we like go back? Why don't we? They're but seeing do something the happening time. in the world and they're trying to explain it. And they're trying to explain it in a context where there is no alternative. We can't go forward. Let's go back. They, I agree with you. They are the enemy. Um, but they are, these ideas don't just come out of nowhere. They exist in a context. People are actually trying to explain something in the world. However, I agree with you. There, were, there are lots of problems in the world today, and people are trying to explain them. But that doesn't make the explanations correct. Most of the explanation, 90% yeah, of the explanation are wrong, are, are, are corrupted. And they're corrupted by very, very fundamental ideas that are part what of... What are they trying the, to explain? They're trying to explain the progressive stagnation of capitalism, the fact that... No, it is, they're it trying to explain the fact that statism... The state is doesn't seem to be happening. The, regulation the historical rate of profit is tending failed. towards zero. Okay. Sorry, people, you are talking <laughs> over each other, so let me finish on a positive note. So I'm very thankful overall in my life to both Ashley and Yaron because for people who know me know that me hanging out with Ashley many years ago was the turning point from me being a boring misanthropist new leftist so that was the starting of my journey and then that journey you know when i came across yaron uh, led me where i am today so don't I'm so blame me for that oh your fault ashley <laughs> <laughs> so i'm very proud i'm very happy with today's discussion i hope the people enjoyed it um, so many thanks for the super chatters thanks to raz for organizing it thanks to the annual institute for supporting it Thanks to Ashley for showing up and uh, facing your own in this discussion. And I hope people got some value out of it and got some food for thought. Okay. Many thanks to both. Many thanks to our viewers. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.